NBC's Robert McNeil was uh, in Dallas and was uh, almost directly behind the president's car in the first bus of uh, news correspondence when the president was felled by the sniper's bullet. And he is still on duty in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now, so we would like to go to WBAP-TV in Fort Worth, Dallas, and NBC's Robert McNeil. It was one of those days that a reporter finds himself musing about when he's half asleep sometimes in a plane. Your mind drifts as you prepare for the big story. What is likely to happen at this moment and that? Sometimes your mind drifts to the most extreme thing that could happen, and you hastily dismiss it because the most extreme thing never does happen. You pull your mind back to the ordinary things that always do happen. This day began in the rain with the ordinary things for a popular president on a grassroots tour, even if it was ostensibly non-political. For a young president with politics in his blood, a refreshing contact with the source of his power, a delirious crowd outside his Fort Worth hotel. His wife, he told them, wasn't there because she was still organizing herself. It takes her longer, the president said, because she looks better than we do. Mrs. Kennedy did appear a little later at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast, timing her entry by waiting outside the door until all others were introduced. She appeared with thunderous applause, radiant in a pink suit and matching pillbox hat. This caused her husband to think back to a day two and a half years ago in Paris. Two years ago, I said that uh myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. A new Mrs. Kennedy has emerged this trip, a first lady no longer shy about the rough and tumble of politics. On arrival in Dallas from Fort Worth, she was true to her new form. She plunged ahead of the president into the ecstatic crowds, some of them caught her glove, mauled her sleeve, even grabbed one of the roses off its stem. There were no hostile signs at the airport crowd, only eagerness for contact with the Kennedys. Then into the open limousine for the motorcade through Dallas. The president had done this thousands of times. He sat on the right, Mrs. Kennedy on the left. Everywhere, the crowds were bigger than expected. Dallas authorities were jittery. Security precautions were the heaviest in the city's history. Dallas was determined that its name, smirched round the world by the attack on UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson last month, would not be dragged through the mud again. There were heavy police forces all along the route. All possible troublemakers had been searched out and warned. All but one. The downtown streets. In the first press bus, we strained to catch any signs of the hostility the Dallas precautions had led us to expect. But all we saw was a vast and friendly crowd, but m many thousands of welcome jack signs. It's approaching 12.30 p.m. Dallas time. The crowds in the tall business district are overfilling the sidewalks. Some throw streamers and torn paper in a miniature ticker tape parade. The reporters look at each other. There have been no incidents. At about 12.32, the motorcade turns a corner into a parkway. The crowds are thinner. NBC cameraman Dave Wigman, in a car ahead of us, takes a passing shot of a building. Then three shots are heard, like toy explosions. Wigman jumps from his car, running towards the president with his camera running. People scream and lie down, grabbing their children. I leave the motorcade and run after police, who appear to be chasing somebody. The motorcade moves off fast. We don't know it, but the president is mortally wounded in the head and throat. His car races for the hospital. The police find no one and return. Looking for a phone, I go into an office. It's on the ground floor of this building, the Texas School Book Depository. It is not more than four minutes after the shooting. 
minutes after a man on the fifth floor of the same building has abandoned a high-powered rifle and fled. Waves of police move in. A small Negro boy tells them he saw a man with a rifle in a window upstairs. Witnesses come up. They saw the president hit. One of the witnesses took this Polaroid picture at the instant of the shooting. It shows the president slumped down in the car. Just as Mary started to take the picture and the president became, came right even with us, two shot, we looked at him and he was looking at a dog in the middle of the seat. Two shots rang out and he grabbed his chest and a look of pain on his face and fell across toward Jackie. And she uh, fell over on him and said, my God, he's shot. And... Uh, that t uh, there was an interval, and then three or four more shots rang out, but that time the motorcade had sped away. The motorcade reaches Parkland Memorial Hospital. It goes immediately to the emergency entrance. Bleeding profusely and unconscious, the president is lifted onto a stretcher and carried to emergency operating room number one. Doctors say his condition is grave and moribund, that is, near death on arrival. A senior house physician is in attendance. A professor of neurosurgery and other doctors come immediately. Mrs. Kennedy, untouched by the bullets, is with her husband. Texas Governor John Connolly, also seriously wounded, is also in an emergency ward. The doctors try every possible way to save the president. Oxygen is given, and anesthetics, a blood transfusion, a tracheotomy, that is making an opening in the throat to aid breathing. The president's heart stops. External massage was applied to his chest, but no pulse results. A priest is called to administer the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church. At approximately one o'clock, the president is dead. The doctors were working too frantically to revive him to notice the exact moment. The press and public do not know the president is dead for another half hour. The only reports available are that he is gravely wounded. At 1.31 Central Time, White House Assistant Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff tells the press the president is dead. At that moment, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, suddenly the new president, leaves the hospital. A new Secret Service detail just arrived, forms up around him, and he leaves for the airport. There, in the president's jet plane, Air Force One, a hastily summoned woman federal judge with a borrowed Bible administers the oath of office. The president's body, in a bronze coffin, is flown to Washington. Dallas police moved with great speed after the shooting. The story of the chase, arrest, and questioning of a suspect from NBC's Tom Pettit at police headquarters in Dallas. In Fort Worth, 28 miles west of Dallas, police picked up one suspect who was later cleared and released. The man apprehended was identified by Fort Worth police as 22-year-old Donald House of Ranger, Texas. House was picked up after Dallas police put out a pickup order on his car following the shooting and killing of a Dallas police officer. As he was taken into police headquarters, House shouted, I didn't do it. And after questioning, he was completely cleared and released. In Dallas, the prime suspect still is being questioned. He is 24-year-old Lee Oswald of Dallas, a former Marine who spent some time in Russia, who at one time had applied for Soviet citizenship. He has been associated with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Dallas homicide captain Will Fritz has directed the interrogation of this suspect who police say has been placed in the building from where the bullets were fired at President Kennedy. Oswald has been charged with the murder of police officer J.D. Tippett who had gone to apprehend Oswald, but he denies killing President Kennedy, says he is being held because he was in Russia. But Dallas police chief J.E. Curry says interrogation of Oswald will continue, that he is a very good suspect in the death of President Kennedy. Tom Pettit, NBC News, at Dallas Police Headquarters. Dallas Police Chief Just Curry has recently reported that his men have found a partial fingerprint on the rifle believed used in the assassination. The weapon will be sent to Washington to ensure proper handling of the print.
The city of Dallas, like the country, is still in a state of shock tonight. Texas Governor John Connolly is in serious but satisfactory condition in hospital. Everyone, public officials, the police, the newspapers, have been too busy to ask the questions about loopholes in security that inevitably will be asked. As President Eisenhower said today, this is the kind of thing that freedom, compatible with democracy, makes possible. The mayor of Dallas, Earl Cabell, in the statement of the city's remorse, has said that all churches in the city will be open tonight. Dallas feels as any American city would if this had happened not here today, but there. This is Robert McNeil, NBC News, reporting.